Hello. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, by the mystery of the Incarnation, you have led the human race that walked in darkness into the radiance of faith that has brought those born in slavery to ancient sin through the waters of regeneration to make them your adopted children. Look upon all who call upon you, Lord, and sustain the weak. Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death and bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good through Christ our Lord. Amen. So uh, we're going to talk about the second scrutiny today, which is the fourth Sunday of Lent. And I'd like to begin by reading the gospel for that day, which is the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said it is, but others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, So how are your eyes opened? He replied, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So when the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see, he said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked them, Is this your son, who you say was blind from birth? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Messiah, they would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we don't know know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, That is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and are you trying to teach us? They threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? 
He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking to you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see, and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sight, you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. I have some experience with um, someone who was born blind. My brother-in-law was born blind. Um, he's a remarkable person, and I'm going to talk a little about him here at the beginning and then as we go through. Um, the, uh, the parish where they lived when he was young had a school for the blind until he was in about sixth grade. So that was easy. He just went to the, the Catholic parish school who happened to have a blind classroom. After the sixth grade, however, that went away, but he was so well integrated into the school and the neighborhood that they just let him finish eighth, eighth grades, uh, the eighth grade there. Uh, he went to the regular Catholic high school, uh, played in the band, and uh, eventually went to the University of Illinois and majored in history and got his uh, Bachelor of Arts degree. One of the things that happened while he was at the University of Illinois was the the students uh, uh, who had handicaps were segregated in a particular dorm. And uh, after about two weeks of that, George, my brother-in-law George, went to the administration and said, exactly, what are you trying to rehabilitate? I've been blind from birth. And at that point, they moved him out of the rehabilitation dorm and into, um, uh, into a regular dorm. So he graduated uh, with his BA in history and then... Uh, toured as a rock and roll and blues drummer for the next 10 years and made his living as a musician. Uh, he got tired of living on food stamps, and so <laughs> he, uh, he went to law school and um, uh, passed the bar and uh, went into practice uh, in uh, community law, helping people who were being evicted uh, to avoid eviction. And he did that for a number of years until finally the city where he lived hired him as city attorney, where he continues to work today. He's married, he has two, uh, two daughters, and um, that's, that's the story of George, and some other stories about him will probably come up as we talk. So uh, John's Gospel is built around seven signs, seven ways in which Jesus manifests himself to uh, people uh, to, to show his uh, divinity. The first is the water into wine at Cana. And the story of the woman at the well that we talked about last week is placed between that sign and the next, next one, which also occurred, uh, occurred at Cana. And that sign was the royal official's son being healed uh, by remote, as it were. Jesus was about 25 kilometers away when he told the, the royal official that his son was well, and it turned out he was. After this, after the, uh, the healing of the, um, the woman at the well and the, uh, the, the, the royal official's son in the fifth chapter, Jesus, Jesus heals a man at a pool called Bethsaida. He can't reach the water while it's stirred up. And so Jesus heals him without having him, uh, having him to go into the water. And this is the third sign, the healing of this man at the pool of Bethsaida. So this reference to living water in chapter 4 with the woman at the well and followed by this miracle at Bethesda is saying that Jesus is the source of living water, not the pool in Jerusalem, not anything else. Jesus is the source of living water. The fourth sign is the mul multiplication of the loaves. And um, I, that is a forecast or a, um, I think that's supposed to call to mind for us the previous miracle of manna in the desert for the Jews uh, escaping from Egypt. That's the fourth sign, the multiplication of the loaves. The fifth sign is when Jesus walks on water, and that's supposed to call to mind the crossing of the Red Sea ahead of the Egyptians. Uh, 
So all these miracles that are occurring have connections to Old Testament stories and, and to the, the history of faith through the people of God. So it's always important to keep that whole history in mind as Jesus lives and works because he's always doing things to call to our mind the works of God in the past. The sixth sign in the Gospel of John is the healing of the man born blind. And like the miracle of the healing of the official, the official son, Jesus isn't actually present when this man regains his sight. And one of the things I wonder about is the significance of that fact, that Jesus wasn't present when these miracles happened, even though he instigated them. And I think uh, for us, uh, living our lives 2,000 years later, we look for miracles where Jesus' uh, um, visible presence isn't there, but still the miracles occur, still Jesus' healings and so forth occur, even though we don't see his physical presence. And the seventh sign in the Gospel of John is the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and that's going uh, to be what we talk about next week. So, but it brings to mind a question for me. How much of our faith rests on signs and personal experiences that, that we've had, and how much of our faith depends on the testimony of others, including the testimony of Scripture? And I'm, I'm just going to pose some questions here without answering any of them, just for your reflection and, uh, and thought. Another question that occurred to me uh, as I was looking at this coming Sunday's readings was the connection between the first reading and this gospel of the healing of the man born blind. The first reading is, uh, recounts the choice of David from among Jesse's sons to be king of Israel. And there doesn't seem to be any water in that, uh, in that reading. There's no miracle healing. And yet the church has chosen to place that reading in juxtaposition with the gospel of the man born blind. So the question is, my question is, what's the connection? Because the church almost always puts these things in juxtaposition for a reason. One thought that occurred to me is that perhaps the, the theme that runs through both readings is Jesus saying, you did not choose me, I chose you. David did not choose to be king. And as a matter of fact, all of his brothers, all six of his brothers were promoted for that position before he was selected. So the God's choice of David is very clear. God says in that reading, the human ways are not my ways, and my way of looking at things isn't the same way that you look at things, and my judgment about people is not the same as your judgment of people. Um, so in, in the case of the woman at the well, in this case with the man born blind, I'm wondering, is, is, these are both cases where Jesus chooses these people to interact and to call to deeper faith. He chooses them. They, cho they don't choose him. So I'm wondering maybe, maybe that's the connection. One of the things I notice in this reading, and we're going to go through it verse by verse, uh, but one of the things I notice is that as soon as this man could see, his life became very difficult. People wondered if he was the same person. So for you who've experienced a conversion in your own lives, um, have you encountered difficulties when your life changed, when you became a different person because of your faith in the Lord? And is there fear around the restoration of his sight, of the blind man's sight? You know, now that he's entering a, a sighted world, he is totally unmoored. He, he is in a situation where he doesn't know anything. He's got to relearn everything. Um, and so there's fear around that change of life. And I think um, for those of us who've, who've encountered the Lord uh, in our lives, uh, sometimes there are fears around that. Very often those fears are voiced as, um, I wonder what he's going to ask of me, and I wonder if I'll have the courage to do it. Um, so for those uh, preparing for the Easter sacraments, I wonder if they have some of those fears. What, what fears surround their own increased awareness of the demands of the gospel? And what choices are, being, are they being called to make as a result of their discipleship? And we'll talk some more about that later. So um, 
We talked a lot about the symbolism and the metaphor of water uh, last week when we were talking about the woman at the well, and obviously with the pool of Siloam, water comes up again. Um, it comes up at the water of Siloam. It comes up in the bread of life discourse, uh, which is before this healing occurs. In the sixth chapter, that's the fourth sign, is the multiplication of the loaves. And uh, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. So that sequence is the multiplication of the loaves, the walking on the water, the bread of life discourse, and then in chapter 7, Jesus enters Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles and says, while he's at the Feast of the Tabernacles, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. So we talked about the Feast of uh, Tabernacles last week, refer, recall, recalling the previous week's gospel, the, uh, the Transfiguration, where Peter wanted to set up the three tents on the mountain and how that was supposed to recall for us the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, where Jews today even celebrate the 40 years they spent in the de desert living in tents. So here Jesus is in Jerusalem celebrating that feast and that's what he says, let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Again, the importance of water as a metaphor for the life that, um, that Jesus offers. One of the things that's interesting uh, here is that quote that Jesus, Jesus speaks, rivers of living water will flow from within him, is not an exact quotation from any of the texts we have. But keep in mind, 2,000 years ago, there were perhaps other texts that were considered scriptural by the Jewish community that have not survived. So I think that's possibly what's going on there. So um, one of the things that you probably noticed is, as the gospel was read is um, the whole question of willful blindness. Um, sometimes people are blind because it's just too painful to see right now. Um, the truth about their own lives very often will blind people because really looking at themselves and their situation honestly would be too painful. So they turn their head away. That's a pretty common thing. I'm afraid of what I might see, so I refuse to look. Um, and that's a, you know, that calls to mind for me a Navajo proverb. And uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, the South African archbishop, uh, also quoted this. But it's a Navajo proverb, and it says, you can't wake a person who is pretending to be asleep. Um, so I think that the parallel between seeing and being awake um, might be apt there. It's hard to get somebody to see whose, uh, whose eyes are, are, are shut fast and you know, refuses to open them. So, uh, to dive into the scripture that we are going to talk about this week, um, Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh chapter of John, and he's still there by the ninth chapter of John when this uh, occurs. So, uh, the very first verse says, uh, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. The fact that Jesus notices the man is I don't know if remarkable because who, who Jesus is, but very often in my life, and I think in many people's lives, we pass by beggars without seeing them. It's painful to see misery and um, to see a person who is beyond hope of restoration, like a person born blind, a person sort of consigned to beg at the gate for the rest of his life, would be very difficult. And since he's there every day, very easy to just see him as sort of part of the the architecture and walk right by him without seeing him. But Jesus saw him. Uh, and that's the first step in the man's healing is that Jesus notices. Um, I think about my own blindness in regarding, uh, regarding the mis misery in the world. Um, and it could be uh, passing homeless people on the street of Boise, or it could be listening to the news and hearing about worldwide misery uh, in different places on how easy it is to just um, just turn a blind eye to all that. <coughs> One of the things that people talk about is compassion fatigue. And very often, we, all of us are confronted with so many needs and so much uh, suffering 
that it's very easy to just get tired out by it and, and let that, that exhaustion uh, turn us into blind people, that we don't notice um, the suffering around us, or at least that we don't feel capable of responding in any way to it. So um, second verse of the, the chapter, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It always makes us feel less vulnerable if we can explain the cause of misfortune because it might help us avoid it uh, in the future. The fact that this kind of misfortune could strike us is terrifying. I think about right now with the coronavirus and people um, obviously are afraid of being infected and, um, and we feel very vulnerable um, going to the store or passing neighbors on the street or going to church. So um, that kind of, if I can explain it, if I can say where this came from, uh, that might help me feel better. Um, so it's natural, I suppose, that the uh, disciples would ask about it. But one inter what's interesting about their question is it assumes that suffering is caused from sin. So then the question is, well, was it his sin or his parents' sin? And it could be the parents' sin. Um, in Exodus, uh, God says, uh, I, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and on the fourth generation of those who hate him, hate me. And that thought is repeated elsewhere in Exodus 2 and in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. So this thought in Jewish theology that the sins of the parents are visited on the children, uh, it's, not, it's not weird that the disciples would ask that question. Um, even today, this, uh, this occurs. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with televangelists or others who uh, preach a prosperity gospel, they say something very similar to this. They say God blesses those, his faithful, with material blessings. Well, he, they don't generally say this, but what follows is if you don't have blessings in your life, if you have curses in your life, well, that must be God too. God blesses the faithful, and he doesn't bless those who aren't faithful. So this, this idea that, um, that somehow God... Um, God punishes people for sin in their life with physical maladies and misfortune is still alive. That, that idea is still alive. Um, actually, the book of Job in the Old Testament was written to combat that idea 4,000 years ago, um, that, that God does not, um, does not visit misfortune on people um, either to test them or to punish them from sin. For sin, so that's uh, that's an important thing, um, and it might be uh, now the the disciples don't just say is it is it the parents' sin? They also say did this man or his parents sin that he was born blind? So uh, how could that be? How could he possibly sin before he was born? But the thought at the time was that he could have sinned in the womb. And he talks about the, uh, the, the example of that in scriptures is uh, Jacob and Esau, twins, battling in the womb with each other. And so that, that idea, that story was in people's minds so that it became possible that a child in the womb could commit sin and therefore uh, this blindness might be a punishment for something like that. The blind man and his parents are undoubtedly accustomed to being... Um, accused of sin and the blindness being the proof of it. Um, the parents probably assumed that his blindness is their fault. They might, even, they might even have a particular theory of what they did that caused the blindness, some secret shame of some kind that haunts them, that they haven't told anybody about, maybe not even each other, the father and mother, but both in their minds, they may be harboring some guilt and thinking that that guilt is what caused the blindness. And every time they hear somebody ask this question, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, every time they hear a question like that, all those feelings and guilt uh, come back. Um, I'm thinking about um, 
when people commit suicide, very often those around them, their parents, their friends, people who uh, recently spoke with them, uh, are racked with that kind of guilt. What could I have done differently? What did I do wrong? Um, so we're all we're all victims to that sort of uh, shame and um, and guilt, and lots of times blame ourselves for things uh, based on that. Now George's blindness, my brother-in-law's blindness, uh, begs an explanation, and uh, it turned out they found one. Um, his mom had measles when he was in utero, and so they think that's what led to the detached retina that uh, caused his blindness. But she was never the same. My my mother-in-law, George's mother, was never the same after he was born. She was constantly on edge, constantly afraid that she would make another mistake that would uh, end up catastrophically. So she lived on edge uh, for the rest of her life, really. So it's it's common that parents who uh, who have children with whatever disability live in that kind of fear and occasionally that kind of shame. So the next verse says this, when Jesus answers, and neither did this man sin nor his parents, but the work that the works of God might be revealed in him. Jesus doesn't think the suffering is caused by sin, but he sees it as an opportunity to heal the man and reveal God's mercy. It's important for us to remember that God's mercy is often revealed through adversity. Our faithfulness in adversity is a compelling witness to others. Our, fel- our faithfulness in helping those in need can also be a compelling witness. We should not forget, though, that there is a connection between sin and suffering. Uh, it's not the case in the blind man, but it is occasionally true. Not all suffering is caused by sin, but all sin does cause suffering. Jesus is saying that sin and suffering are not always related, but he doesn't say that they are never related. We do the truth a disservice if we use this text to teach people that sin and suffering aren't related. When I sin, I hurt those closest to me and myself as well. Children do pay the price for their parents' sins. I think of crack babies as being an example of that. But the principle holds in less extreme circumstances too. I'm thinking of, of social sin. I'm thinking of all the ways in which, um, in which I, I either am complicit or uh, stand by while larger structures of sin are held in place and cause suffering to others. And I can say, well, I, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. That's too big for me. That's too far away. But, um, but that's still true. Actually, when I was preparing this uh, series of talks, I was speaking with Rusty Bang, the youth minister at Holy Apostles, and I told him I was going to be talking about the three scrutinies of Lent, and he said, are you going to talk about social sin too, not just personal sin? And that was a wonderful question, and it caused me to look at the talks and really examine them that, that make sure that, that that particular subject was covered, because there is more to sin than just... Um, you know, I I did something to hurt you. Lots of times, the things uh, the things that turn out to be the most sinful are not things I do at all, but things that I I hold back from doing when I should do them that impact larger numbers of people. Sin is generally like a a pebble in a pond. You know, the it doesn't look like much when it goes in, but the ripples that spread out from the act uh, can be very far-reaching. Um, so. Um, Jesus says that sin is not the cause of this man's infirmity. The disciples thought that it was, but they were mistaken. So another lesson here is we have to be careful about judging other people's sin. It's all too tempting to make negative judgments when we don't have all the facts, like the disciples did in this situation. So Jesus responds, We have to do the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. He says we have to do the works of him who sent me. So that's that's you and I. That's that's the disciples. That's the church today. We have to feel a sense of urgency because time comes when we can't work. It's true in the eschological sense of the second coming, but it's also true in another sense. A neighbor recently died suddenly and unexpectedly. And I'd spoken with him frequently, but I never told him about my faith. 
So that opportunity is gone and it won't return. So someday um, I too will die. And whatever good I do, I have to do now while I'm alive and able to. Jesus says in the next verse, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And that brings to mind the beginning of John's gospel, which I will read for you now. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. And this is the, uh, the point, I guess. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Light and darkness are symbols of good and evil in this gospel. You might remember in the third chapter, um, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. And this is what he says in that conversation. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light, for their works were evil. In the eighth chapter of, uh, of John's gospel, he told the woman caught in adultery, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And now he says the same thing um, to his disciples in discussing the blind man. Well, one of the things that's interesting about this to me is that this is all taking place, as you remember, during the Festival of Booths or the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And one of the things they did liturgically uh, at the temple in Jerusalem during this feast was there was a large candelabra and it was lighted in the temple court high on the Temple Mount so that everybody could see it. And it symbolized the revelation and truth of the Jewish faith to the world. So it's during this festival that Jesus declares himself to be the light of the world. The other thing that's interesting there is the I am the light of the world. Those I am statements are all over the place from Jesus. And it's reminiscent of the very name of God, Yahweh, which is translated as I am. So uh, it happens over and over again in John's gospel. I think there are eight or nine instances of it. Um, Jesus has come to enlighten people about God, and, and as a prophetic action, he heals this blind man. It's an opportunity for him to demonstrate that he is light-bearing. Um, he will bring physical light to the blind man just as he will bring spiritual light to the world. And again, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different instances in John's Gospel where Jesus refers to himself at, by beginning with, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life, and so forth. So after he says this, Jesus spat on the ground, made mud with saliva, and anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Where was the social distancing when this was happening? <laughs> I just You don't often think about people um, spitting on the ground and then making mud and putting it on somebody else. It doesn't sound like a healing gesture, but in those days it was. Um, the, now, the man had not expressed faith or asked for healing. His role has been totally passive. He's sitting there as a beggar. The disciples ask about his, his life and whether he's a sinner. Jesus explains that it's not sin. It's an opportunity for God to act. And then God, Jesus performs this act, spitting on the ground and so forth. So the man is totally passive until this moment. And then, so um, the people of that day believed in the medicinal use of spit. Odd, but there it is. Here in Jesus' hands, it's a familiar folk remedy and it becomes a, phys a, a vehicle for physical healing. Jesus' use of mud might be recalling the creation story because God brought forth life from the dust of the earth, from mud. And Jesus' healing of the blind man is creative rather than just restorative. Because restorative, remember, the man was blind from birth. He never had sight. So it's not that sight that he had is being restored, and in, instead, God, Jesus, is re creating sight from nothing, just as God created the world itself. So then after he does this little mud paste thing, Jesus says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, 
early readers of the gospel would bring to mind early other stories um, that they knew from their own history or from scriptures. Hundreds of years earlier, King Hezekiah had cut a long tunnel through solid rock from the Kidron Valley water source into Jerusalem to protect the city's water supply in the event of siege. This is this fact is chronicled in Second Chronicles and in Isaiah and in Second Kings. So the pool of Siloam is a reservoir inside the city at the end of this tunnel. So the water comes through this tunnel that King Hezekiah has engineered and, and comes into the pool of Siloam. So Jesus instructs the blind man to wash there. And that's supposed to recall for us how uh, Naaman uh, was healed by Elisha in Second Kings. Same kind of situation. Washing is required. Elisha says, go wash in the pool, in the, in the Jordan, I guess it was. And, um, and the, the Naaman, the, the uh, official, says, oh, I'm not going to do that. I didn't come all this way to Jerusalem to just wash in a muddy river. And his, his assistant says to him, if he'd asked you to do something remarkable, you would have done it. You'd have done anything to be healed. So why not just do this simple thing? So he does and he's healed. That's all recounted in 2 Kings. Um, The healing takes place only after the person has obeyed. At the Feast of Booths, the priests pour water from the Pool of Siloam onto the temple steps so that it would flow down out through the temple into the world outside and indicate the way that Jewish faith would satisfy the whole world. Jesus is saying, that's me. I'm the one who satisfies that, that thirst. I'm the living water. But this pool of Siloam is, is significant because it's used in the liturgy at the Feast of Booths, which is what's being celebrated right now. It's, it's, it's integral to that liturgy. And Jesus uses that fact for this healing and to make a larger point about, his, about who he is and what he does. So, Siloam, by the way, and it says in the scripture, means sent. And the Greek word for that is the same word that we have, that we translate as apostle. So in a way, he's saying, go to the pool that is called apostle. I think that's significant because the early readers of the gospel would be hearing that as saying, Jesus is sending those who need healing to us, to wash them in baptism, to heal them uh, by our effort. So, um, and that, that theme of being sent by God is throughout the, throughout the scriptures. As Jesus often says, he who sees me, sees him who sent me. So Jesus is the one who's sent in that sense. Jesus is God's apostle, just as the disciples are Jesus' apostle. So <coughs> the, um, the man born blind goes away, and he washes, and he comes back seeing. The early church associated that healing with baptism. It appears in Catacomart as an example of baptism. And even today, uh, an, an, a little used part of the ritual of baptism is a prayer over the ears, eyes, and mouth of uh, the person being baptized. This is called the ephatha, and that word means be opened, and the priest touches the child's ears and the mouth and the thumb uh, and with his thumb, and, and he says, ears, receive the word of the Lord as he touches the mouth, proclaim his faith and uh, to the praise and glory of God. So historically, the priest wets his thumb with spit to administer this part of the ritual. Now, many churches skip this today, but um, it's that whole ritual at the baptism is meant to recall this healing in the Gospel of John. The combination of the miracle of sight and the use of water make this ideal for, uh, for use as a scrutiny for the catechumen who are preparing for their own baptismal commitment at Easter. So the healing has occurred, and uh, now people begin to notice Isn't this the man who sat and begged? The man's neighbors recognize but do not recognize the man. Some some recognize him, some don't. Some think he's the blind man, others think he just resembles the blind man. And it's easy to understand their confusion. There's no cure for lifelong blindness, so this couldn't be the blind man. 
Furthermore, the blind man has been a fixture for many years, and they're accustomed to seeing him begging along the roadside, half-seeing him, like we often half-see the marginalized. So some people say, well, he looks like him, but he looks different now that he can see, and you know this for a fact. Um, our eyes are sort of windows into, in, inside us. So people, not only we see people with our eyes, but we see them through their eyes. We, we see the life in their eyes. Before, this man's eyes were dull and lifeless, and his posture and demeanor were those of a beggar courting pity, and he was defeated. And now his eyes are open and full of life, and he can respond to visual stimulus, and he's astonished and excited. And he's no longer crouching and looking defeated, and he's no longer begging by the side of the road. So no wonder that it's hard to recognize him. So people ask him, how were your eyes opened? So this interrogation by other citizens is the first of four under, uh, interrogations this guy's going to go through. Four interrogations. So it, I, the restoration of sight was not all uh, was not all good news. He just he now this is the beginning of the ringer that he's going to be put through. He says, "A man called Jesus made mud, anointed my eyes, and said to me, "Go to the pool of Siloam and wash." So I went away and washed, and I received my sight. So the crowd's confused, and that gives the man an opportunity to witness for what Jesus has done for him. Then they asked him, well, where is he? And he says, I don't know. Um, and this, this humility and ignorance on the part of the man is contrasted to the ignorance of the Pharisees, who are very quick to say how much they know. This man is honest. I don't know. The Pharisees throughout here claim knowledge that they really don't have. Um, so people are confused, and they bring him to the Pharisees. They bring uh, this uh, formerly blind man to the Pharisees. They don't know what to think. The Pharisees are religious authorities, so maybe they can uh, make some sense of this. And we're all looking for people who can help us make sense of things in our lives. The search for meaning is pretty universal. So it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And he's already been involved in one Sabbath controversy similar to this one when he healed the man at Bethesda. So in that situation, that man had been uh, ill for 38 years. So 38 years, born blind, amazing miracles in both cases, um, and in both cases um, done on the Sabbath and therefore controversial. Again, therefore... The Pharisees asked him how he received his sight. So here he goes, his second interrogation. The man says, he put mud on my eyes, I washed and I see. The man explains in brief what Jesus did. However, it isn't what Jesus did, but the fact that he did it on the Sabbath that makes it interesting to the Pharisees. So some of the Pharisees say, well, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. The healing of the blind man is a sign in John's gospel pointing to Christ. And the blind man sees that, but the Pharisees don't see it. The, Phar the blind man sees, the Pharisees are blind. But let's be fair to the Pharisees. They have a point. From their perspective, the man's condition was chronic, not acute. There was no life or death consequence if Jesus delayed the healing until the end of Sabbath. Neither Jesus nor the blind man can travel on the Sabbath, so they'll still be together tomorrow when the Sabbath is over. Therefore, the Pharisees believe that Jesus violated the law by performing unnecessary work on the Sabbath. Making mud with spittle, was kneading, was one of the prohibited activities on the Sabbath. Healing is one of the prohibited activities. So um, the fact that Jesus healed the man does not prove that this healing is from God either. And the Pharisees were very aware of that. They know from their history, from their scriptures, that Egyptian magicians also were able to do many of the same things that Moses did. Uh, and that's in Exodus 7 and 8, and as they say, you could look that up. Jesus himself warns later uh, in Matthew, for there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and they will show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. So how can we know if a great sign is true or is it, it comes from a false prophet? In the case of the blind man, the Pharisees apply a simple test. 
if the, vi- if the healing violates God's law, it can't be from God. Common sense rule. But it leads them to a false conclusion because they're relying on rabbinic interpretation of the law rather than on the law itself to determine what is and is not allowable. In other words, just Jesus did disobey, not God's law though, but human interpretation of that law. So this is just another case of Pharisaic pride. They think they have the light, they think they know the answers, they think they're right, and they resist anything from Jesus to the contrary. Now others said, how can, this, how can a man who is a sinner do things like this? So there was division among the Pharisees, and that's good to see. Because very often the Pharisees are presented to us in the Gospels as just hardline opponents of Jesus. But this verse softens that image a little bit. The fact that some Pharisees can ask how a sinner can perform such signs tell us that there were some who were open to truth, to something other than what they already believed. So the Pharisees ask the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And they continue to interrogate him and asking his opinion. And this never would have happened normally. Uh, it's almost certain, certainly the only time in his life that somebody in authority has asked his opinion about anything. Uh, and the fact that they're asking his opinion really does show how confused and baffled the Pharisees are. So he says... He's a prophet. This is a progression in the man's witness and understanding of who Jesus is. He starts out not even knowing who he is. He says, I don't know. And now he says he's a prophet. Um, You might remember when we were talking about the woman at the well last week that um, there was a progression with her too. She started out with you Jew, and then she ended up with Sir, and then she went to, you're a prophet, I can see you're a prophet, and finally, yeah, this is the Christ. So the, that pro- progression in belief that occurred with the woman at the well is also occurring with the man born blind, and it's another reason why that's a really important part of the, uh, of the scrutiny for those entering the church at Easter. The next verse, now on verse 18, if you're trying to follow along here. Uh, The Jews therefore did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. The Jews refers again to just the Jewish leaders who are hostile. This formerly blind man probably lived with his parents all his life. He wasn't able except by begging to to earn a living. Um, So He's been there from the time he was born. They know he was born blind. And they can confirm that this is indeed their son. So they're interrogating the parents now. And um, the parents answer, uh, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. We, uh, we don't know how he, opened, how he now sees, nor do we know how, who opened his eyes. He's of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself remarkable that parents would divert this hostile questioning to their son. They undoubtedly uh, felt uh, grief and sorrow for their son as he grew up blind and had to beg. They probably felt guilty. Um, They had to provide extra care for him to protect him. Seeing him begging alongside the roadside must have caused them shame. And now suddenly he can see. But the parents can't enjoy it because... They're being put on the spot by the, the religious authorities. And it often takes real courage to speak the truth to power when power doesn't want to hear it. Now, Scripture says, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone would confess him as Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Dismissal from the synagogue would mean being ostracized by the community and separated from God. In the book of Ezra, it suggests it might also result in the forfeiture of one's possessions. Now, I've read some about, uh, about this situation. Prior to the destruction of the temple in the year 65 or so, um, expulsion from the synagogue wasn't really something that happened very often. So this threat of the Pharisees in the ninth chapter of John seems to be a projection backwards from the time of the 
the, the, the gospel, that the, those reading the gospel would have known people who were thrown out of the synagogue for confessing Jesus. And so they're projecting that back into history and saying that this, this is the kind of thing that was being uh, threatened uh, to these pe- parents. But maybe not. Uh, maybe they were just going to be thrown out uh, of, the, of the audience with the Pharisees. But anyway, they called the blind man a second time and said to him, Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Give glory to God is a technical term calling for truthfulness. It's like an oath. It's like, it's like put your hand on a Bible and swear that this is what happened. Um, so it's, it's, and it's especially in regard to confession of sins. It's like testifying an oath. So the authorities ask him to, to, to say under oath that Jesus is a sinner. Pharisees say that. They say, we know, we know he's a sinner. We know this man is a sinner. Um, The the phrase know, or we know, uh, uh, recurs 11 times uh, in this particular reading in John's Gospel. This whole gospel is about seeing and knowing. Who sees accurately? Who knows and what do they know and how do they know it? So those are the questions that underpin everything in this gospel. So the man says, I don't know if he's a sinner. They try to get the man to confirm their opinion that Jesus is a sinner. But the man can't do that because he has no knowledge to that effect. He is, the the blind man is totally staying in his own lane. He has not heard Jesus say, judge not lest you be judged, but he sure is, um, he's sure following that a- action. He does, he does, he's not about to make a judgment about something he doesn't know anything about. He does see this. One thing I know, though I was blind, now I see. So he sticks to what he does know. And those are two facts to which he can bear personal testimony. And he's not going to go any farther than that. So they say, the Pharisees, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? This kind of repeated questioning is meant to intimidate and it's meant to to poke holes in the story. So I mean, we've all watched crime dramas on television where the where the police are interrogating somebody and they'll they'll ask the questions again and again and very often the accused will say well you I already told you I already answered that question it's exactly what's happening in this in this gospel and that's exactly what the blind man says or the formerly blind man says I told you already and you didn't listen why do you want to hear it again you don't want to become his disciples too do you He's taunting his questioners. He's exhibiting great courage. He's the only member of his family who's shown any courage in this story. He's lived his entire life in darkness, and suddenly he finds himself in the spotlight with these interrogators. Most people would be overwhelmed by that, but he is up to it. He's equal to the situation, and he now refuses to be drawn into opinions about things he does not know, steadfastly affirming the things he does know. So he says, do you, want to be, do you want to become his disciples too? And, the, and the, um, the Pharisees respond, you're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. This verse reflects the conflict between the church and the Pharisees at the time of the writing of the Gospels. The Pharisees considered themselves disciples of Moses. The readers of the gospel know that they would better understand Moses if they followed Jesus, that Moses pointed to Jesus. And Jesus himself says uh, on the last day, Moses himself will be their accuser. The Pharisees assume they know that Jesus is a sinner, but they don't really know who he is or where he comes from. And the power of the blind man's witness is reflected in the angry response of the authorities. Known for their learning, they find themselves losing a debate with an unschooled beggar. Capable of arguing fine points of the law was what they did. That was, their, that was what their, their whole deal was as Pharisees. And now they're finding themselves bested by this man just telling the simple truth of what happened to him. So there's a lesson for us in this. 
There's power in our testimony about what Christ has done for us. And I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of a couple things that it says in the gospel elsewhere, not in John's gospel, but in Luke's and Mark's. It says, Jesus says, he counsels his disciples, do not prepare for your defense beforehand, for the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. So, um, so the, uh, the man who had been born blind says, how amazing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. There's a lot of irony in that. The blind man sees, but those who have eyes choose to close them to the truth. The authorities call the man to give glory to God by denouncing Jesus as a sinner, but the man gives glory to God by witnessing to Christ. The authorities continue questioning, trying to find a hole in his testimony. He responds by asking if they want to become Jesus' disciples. The authorities say that Moses' authority comes from God, but they don't know where Jesus comes from, implying that he must not come from God. The man responds by pointing out the obvious truth that if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. The authorities imply that one cannot be a follower of Moses and Jesus, but one must choose one or the other. The message of the whole gospel, the fourth gospel, is that one can be faithful to Moses only by being faithful to Jesus. The authorities continually use this phrase, we know. We know that we know that we know Moses, we know the law, but repeatedly they reveal their ignorance. The authorities accuse the man of trying to teach them. The reader, you and I, are aware that he's capable of doing just that. He is totally capable of teaching them, but they refuse to learn. So the passage continues. We know that Jesus doesn't listen to we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Now earlier the Pharisees said, We know this man is a sinner, and we know that God has spoken to Moses. Now the formerly blind man says, We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. Important context here. The blind man is not denying God's mercy, but establishing that the man who healed him did so by God's power. He's taunting his questioners, not revealing a universal truth. Because we know elsewhere from Scripture and from our own experience that God does hear and forgive sinners who confess their sins. So God's mercy does include sinners and listens to them when they pray. That's not the point. The point is he could do nothing if God had not helped him with this. Without God, none of this could have happened. The next verse. Since the world began, it has never been heard of that anyone opened the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. There it is. If this man were were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, Scripture talks about the blind being able to see. uh, There are about three places in Isaiah where that's promised. But, as he points out, there's no place where a man born blind has been healed. Um, So, with my brother-in-law, George, uh, at one point, um, they went to New York to uh, seek um, medical counsel on what could be done. And now you have to remember that this, is, um, this takes place sometime in the 1950s. Now, discovered early enough, detached retinas can be, can be healed by microsurgery. But at the time, that was not possible. So you might ask yourself, well, this is many years later, the the retina is still detached, why don't they just attach it now so that George could learn to see now? But the problem is that there's a very small window in which the human brain uh, knows how to um, adjust, adjusts to data from the eyes and interprets it so that that we who are looking and seeing, uh, our brains know what to do with that, that information. Um, once that window is closed, even if you reattach the retina, the, the blindness would still be profound because the brain wouldn't know how to interpret the data. That's the point. Um, so in a way, this is a double miracle. Not only is the blind man healed, but... The healing of his sight does not cause confusion. His brain is immediately able to um, 
to interpret the data from, from his eyes. There's a neurologist who talks about this phenomenon of how the, the, you have to sort of die to being a blind person and being born again as a seeing person. So Jesus not only heals the man's eyes, but gives him the mental, mental ability to understand what he's seeing. So it really is a, a double miracle. So the next verse says, You were altogether born in sin, and you, do you teach us? The Pharisees are the undisputed authorities in religious matters, and they take pride in that effect. To be on the losing side of an argument with a beggar is more than they can stand. So they try to... Uh, they try to damage the formerly blind man's character. They throw mud. Their contention was that he was born entirely in sin based on their assumption that his blindness was caused by his sin or those of his parents. Now, Jesus has already denied that. But the Pharisees aren't interested in discussing theology anymore. They're just trying to win. So they throw him out. They excommunicate him from the synagogue, or maybe they just tell him to leave, um, one of the verses there, verse 22, seems to suggest that he's excommunicated. But Ray Brown, who's a foremost Catholic scholar of the Gospel of John, uh, doesn't think that that's true. He thinks it probably was just threw him out from where they were uh, interrogating him. Permanent excommunication would have been religiously, socially, and financially catastrophic, but only would be possible after the destruction of the temple. So Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and finding him... Uh, and, and finding him so asks him you know, the question, do you believe in the Son of God? So in the hour of the man's need, Jesus comes to him. Now remember, all through this, the man has never met Jesus where he can see him. Jesus acted upon him before he could see. He went to the pool and washed his eyes. He's never seen Jesus. He's never spoken with him. So the person who healed him is totally an anonymous person to him. So in the hour of need, Jesus comes to him. Now, St. John Chrysostom says, the Jews cast him out of the temple. The Lord of the temple found him. Many early Christians would have been banned from the synagogue and would find comfort in this story. So Jesus asks him, do you believe in the Son of God? Unlike modern TV evangelists, Jesus did not ask the question before healing the man. First, he healed the man, and now he asks if he believes in him. Now, one of the things that's always interesting to me, that, that, that phrase, do you believe in Jesus, and so forth, is all over this gospel and the others. And so what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Uh, we have a whole creed, a whole list of things that we ass assent to at Mass when we, when we recite the creed. But I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think, because the creed hadn't even been written, obviously, uh, at this time, um, I think what it's talking about is trust. It's talking about a personal relationship of faithfulness that really involves fundamental trust in the other person. So when Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man or do you believe in the Son of God, Jesus says, do you trust me? Do you, do you trust the Son of Man? Do you trust the person who healed you? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Now, the Pharisees were predisposed not to believe in Jesus, but this man is predisposed to believe. He's experienced firsthand Jesus' compassion and power. Not only Jesus has, uh, now, now, Jesus only has to fill in the blanks so the man knows who to trust. Who is it that did this for me? I'm ready, I'm ready to trust him. Jesus says, you have both seen and known him. You have both seen him, and it is he who speaks to you now. Now, my brother-in-law, George, was remarkable at recognizing voices and recognizing even sounds in the room with him. So perhaps as soon as Jesus came up to man and, and introduced himself, um, maybe the, the man born blind would have known that this is the same person who put, the, put the, the mud on his eyes and healed him. He might have known immediately. Um, but in any case, this was a turning point in this man's life. So I would, I would think so. I would think so. So the man says, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. When Jesus identifies himself as the son, 
the man confesses his belief and worships him. This is the final step in opening his spiritual eyes. So the progression is complete. And then Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment, that those who don't see may see, and those who see may become blind. Jesus does not force belief or unbelief on either the blind man or the authorities. He acts in a way that reveals God's glory, and then he allows people to choose. I think it's significant that neither the woman at the well nor the man born blind are ever named. We never learn their names. And I think that's because we're supposed to identify with them. We're supposed to see ourselves in the sinful woman at the well, the outcast, the, the cast aside, the, the ostracized. We're supposed to see ourselves in the beggar at the side of the road. We're, we're supposed to see ourselves in the, in the person born blind. And um, at that point, we were supposed to come to conversion as they did. We're supposed to hear the words of Jesus spoken to them, the compassion of God given to them, and we're supposed to take those on for ourselves. I think that's the point of both of these readings, and that's what makes them so significant during the, uh, the season of Lent. Thank you for your attention.